Chapter One of The Fundamental Doctrines of the Christian Faith by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter One Inspiration, or To What Extent Is the Bible Inspired of God? For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter one verse twenty one. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Timothy chapter three verses sixteen and seventeen. Our subject this morning is the inspiration of the Bible, or to what extent is the Bible inspired of God? The subject is of vital and fundamental importance. If we can make it clear that the writers of the various books of the Bible were inspired of God in a sense that no other men were ever inspired of God, that they were so gifted and taught and led and governed by the Holy Spirit in their utterances as recorded in the Bible, that they taught the truth and nothing but the truth, that their teachings were absolutely without error, then we have in the Bible a court of final appeal and of infallible wisdom to which we can go to settle every question of doctrine or duty. But if the writers of the Bible were inspired, only in the vague and uncertain sense that Shakespeare, Browning, and many other men of genius were inspired, only inspired to the extent that their minds were made more keen to see the truth than ordinary men, but still only in such a way that they made mistakes, or chose the wrong word to express their thought, so that we must recast their thought by discovering, if we may, what the inspired thought back of the uninspired words was, then we are all at sea in hopeless confusion, so that each generation must settle for itself what the Holy Spirit meant to say through the blundering reporters. And it is absolutely certain that no generation can determine with anything approximating accuracy what the Spirit meant, and so no generation can arrive at the truth, but simply promulgate blunders for the next and wiser generation to correct, to be corrected in turn by the next generation that follows it. Thank God that this latter subtle but popular doctrine can be proven to be utterly untrue. There is great need of crystal clear teaching on this subject, because our colleges and seminaries, and pulpits, and Sunday schools, and religious papers, are full of teaching that is vague, inaccurate, misleading, unscriptural, and oftentimes grossly false. There are many in these days who say, I believe that the Bible is inspired when by inspired, they do not mean at all what you understand, or what the mighty men of faith in the past meant by inspired. They often say that they believe the Bible is the word of God, when at the same time they believe it is full of errors. Now the Bible is as clear as crystal in its teaching, and claims regarding itself, and either those claims are true, or else the Bible is the biggest fraud in all the literature of the human race. The position held by so many today that the Bible is a good book, perhaps the best book in the world, but at the same time it is full of errors that must be corrected by the higher wisdom of our day, it is utterly illogical and absolutely ridiculous. If the Bible is not what it claims to be, it is a fraud, an outrageous fraud. What does the Bible teach and claim concerning itself? What does it teach and claim regarding the fact and extent of its own inspiration? The first thing that the Bible teaches on this point and claims for itself is that the work of the Holy Spirit in apostles and prophets, in the various human authors of the different books of the Bible, differs from his work in other men, even in other believers in Christ. It teaches that the Holy Spirit imparts to apostles and prophets an especial gift for an especial purpose. We find this clearly taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, 8 to 11, 28 and 29, where we read, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. For to one is given, through the Spirit, the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge, according to the same Spirit, to another faith in the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing in the same Spirit, and to another working of miracles, powers, and to another prophecy, and to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh the one and the same Spirit, dividing to each one severally even as he will. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, 
helps, governments, diverse kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? This chapter is the fullest and clearest chapter in the Bible on the subject of the various gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is the classical chapter on the whole subject, and the teaching of these verses is as plain as language can make it, and it states in terms, the meaning of which is unmistakable, that the gift bestowed on apostles and prophets differed in kind from the gifts bestowed on other believers, even though those believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only did the work of the Holy Spirit in the apostles and prophets differ from his work in men of genius, but even from his work in other believers. These verses make it as plain as day that the doctrine which has become so common and so popular in our day, that the work of the Holy Spirit in preachers and teachers and in ordinary believers, illuminating them and guiding them into the truth and into the understanding of the word of God, is the same in kind and differs only in degree from the work of the Holy Spirit in apostles and prophets, is thoroughly unscriptural and untrue. This doctrine overlooks what is here so clearly stated and so carefully elucidated, that while there is the same Spirit, there are diversities of gifts, diversities of ministrations, diversities of workings. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 40, and that not all are prophets or apostles. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. Those who desire to minimize the difference between the work of the Holy Spirit in apostles and prophets, and his work in other men, often refer to the fact that the Bible itself says that Bezaliel, the architect of the tabernacle, was to be filled with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise the work of the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 to 11. As a proof that the inspiration of the prophet does not differ in kind from the inspiration of the artist or the architect. This argument at first glance seems plausible, but when we bear in mind the facts about the tabernacle, especially the fact that the tabernacle was to be built after the pattern shown to Moses on the mount, Exodus chapter 25, verses 8, 9, and 40, and that therefore it was itself a revelation from God, a prophecy, a setting forth of the truth of God, the argument loses all its force. The tabernacle was the word of God done into wood, gold, silver, brass, cloth, skin, etc. Just as truly the word of God and the revealing of God's truth as if the truth were printed on a page. So, of course, Bezaliel needed to be inspired. He was a prophet, a prophet who uttered his prophecies in the details of the tabernacle. There's much reasoning about inspiration today that appear at first sight very learned, but that will not bear much scrutiny or candid comparison with the teachings of the Word of God. There is nothing in the Bible more inspired than the tabernacle, and if the destructive critics would study the tabernacle more carefully and thoroughly, they would be led to give up their ingenious but untenable theories, not only about the construction of the tabernacle, but about many other things as well. I have never heard or known of a single destructive critic who had ever given a thorough study to the real meaning of the tabernacle in all its parts, or who had any considerable understanding of the types of scripture. I have challenged the critics in the university centers of England, Ireland, and Scotland to name one single destructive critic who has ever made any thorough study of the types, and no one has ever attempted to even suggest one. The second thing taught in the Bible regarding the inspiration of the apostles and prophets, the inspiration of the various authors of the books of the Bible, is that truth hidden from men for ages, and which they had not discovered, and could not discover, by the unaided process of human reasoning, even human reasoning at its very best and highest, has been revealed to apostles and prophets in the Holy Spirit. We find this very clearly taught in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 2 to 5. If so be that ye have heard of the dispensation of that grace of God which was given me to you word, how that by revelation was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read, ye can perceive my understanding in the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known unto the sons of men, as it hath now been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. The meaning of these words is unmistakable. Paul here declares in words, the meaning of which is perfectly plain, that God in the Spirit had revealed under his holy apostles and prophets the mystery of Christ, which in former generations had not been made known unto the sons of men, 
which they had not discovered and could not discover, except by revelation from God. Paul and the other apostles and prophets knew it by direct revelation from God himself through the Holy Ghost. The teaching is inescapable, that the Bible contains truth that men never had discovered, and never could have discovered, if left to themselves, but truth which the Father in great grace has revealed to his children through his servants, the prophets and apostles. We see in this the folly, a folly so common in our day, of seeking to test the statements of Scripture by the conclusions of human reasoning, or by the intuitions of the Christian consciousness. The revelation of God transcends human reasoning, and therefore human reasoning cannot be its test. Furthermore, a consciousness that is truly and fully Christian is the product of the study and absorption of Bible truth. It is not the test of the truth of the Bible. It is the product of meditation on the Bible. If our consciousness differs from the statements of the Bible, it is not as yet fully Christian consciousness, and the thing for us to do is not to try to pull God's revelation down to the level of our consciousness, but to tone our consciences up to the level of God's word. The third thing that the Bible makes perfectly clear as to the inspiration of the prophets and apostles is that the revelation made by God through his Holy Spirit to the prophets was independent of the prophets' own thinking, that it was made to them by the Spirit of Christ which was in them, and that they themselves oftentimes did not thoroughly understand the full meaning of what the Spirit was saying through them, and that what they said was a subject of diligent search and inquiry to their own mind as to its meaning. This comes out very plainly in First Peter chapter 1, verses 10-12. to 12. Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what time or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did point to, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow them. Unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto you, did they minister these things, which now have been announced unto you through them that preach the gospel unto you by the Holy Spirit sent forth from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. Here again the meaning is as clear as day and inescapable. We are told that the prophets had a revelation made to them by the Holy Spirit, the meaning of which they did not thoroughly comprehend, and that they themselves sought and searched diligently as to the meaning of this revelation, which was made to them and which they recorded. The Spirit, through them testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, e.g. in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, Psalm 22, and the glories that should follow them. They recorded what the Spirit testified, but what it meant they did not thoroughly understand. It was not merely that their minds were made keen to see things which they would not otherwise see, and which they, therefore, more or less accurately recorded. No, there was a definite revelation, arising not from their own minds at all, but from the Spirit of God, who made the revelation to them, and this they recorded, but it was not of themselves, to that extent that they themselves wondered as to what its meaning might be. What they recorded was not at all their own thought. It was the thought of the Holy Spirit who spoke through them. How utterly different this conception is from that which is so persistently taught in many of our colleges and theological seminaries and pulpits. How utterly different it is from the conception that was taught a week ago today in one of the pulpits of our own city. The fourth thing that the Bible makes perfectly clear is that not one single prophetic utterance was of the prophet's own will i.e., it was not in any sense merely what he wished to say. But in every instance the prophet spoke from God, and the prophet was carried along in the prophetic utterance by the Holy Spirit, regardless of his own will or thought. We find this stated practically in so many words in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where we read, For no prophecy, literally not a prophecy, ever came, literally was brought, by the will of man, but men spake from God being moved, literally carried along, or born, by the Holy Spirit. There can be no honest mistaking of the meaning of this language. The prophet never thought that there was something that needed to be said, and therefore said it. But God took possession of the prophet, carried him along in his utterance, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he spake, not from his own consciousness, and not from his own reasoning, nor from his own intuition, but from God. As God's messenger, he spoke what God told him to say. 
The fifth thing that the Bible teaches regarding the inspiration of the prophets and the apostles, and their utterances, is that the Holy Spirit was the real speaker in the prophetic utterances, that what was said or written was the Holy Spirit's word that was upon the apostle's tongue, and not the word of the prophet or apostle. This is said in the Bible in so many words over and over again. For example, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, we read, Wherefore, even as the Holy Spirit saith, Today, if ye shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts, etc. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews is quoting Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8, and says that what the psalmist is recorded as saying, the Holy Spirit saith. Again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 15 and 16, we read, And the Holy Spirit also beareth witness to us, for after he had said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws on their heart, and upon their mind also I will write them. Now the author of the epistle to the Hebrews is quoting Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, and he does not hesitate to say that the testimony that Jeremiah there bore is the testimony of the Holy Ghost, that the Holy Ghost was the real speaker. Again, we read in Acts chapter 28, verses 25 and 26, that Paul said, Well spake the Holy Spirit through Isaiah the prophet unto your fathers, saying, Go thou unto this people, and say, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall in no wise understand, and seeing ye shall see, and in no wise perceive, etc. Here Paul is quoting Isaiah's words as recorded in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, the ninth and tenth verses, and he distinctly says that the real speaker was not Isaiah, but the Holy Spirit, who spoke through Isaiah the prophet. Turning now to the Old Testament, we read in Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, this assertion by David regarding the things that he said and wrote. The Spirit of Jehovah spake by me, and his word was upon my tongue. There can be no mistaking the meaning of these words on the part of any one who goes to the Bible to find out what it really claims and teaches. The Holy Spirit was the real speaker in the prophetic utterance. It was the Holy Spirit's utterance that it was upon the prophet's tongue. The prophet was simply the mouth by which the Holy Spirit spoke. Merely as a man, except as the Spirit taught him and used him, the prophet was fallible as other men are fallible. But when the Spirit was upon him, when he was taken up and borne along by the Holy Spirit, then he became infallible in his teachings, for his teachings were not his, but the teachings of the Holy Spirit. It was God who was then speaking, not the prophet. For example, Paul, merely as a man, even as a Christian man, doubtless had many mistaken notions on many things, and was more or less subject to the ideas and opinions of his time. But when he taught as an apostle, under the power of the Holy Spirit, he was infallible, or rather, the Spirit who taught through him was infallible, and the teachings that resulted from the Spirit's teaching through him were infallible, as infallible as God. Common sense demands of us that we carefully distinguish between what Paul may have thought as a man and what he actually taught as an apostle. In the Bible, we have the record of what he taught as an apostle. Someone may cite as a possible exception to this statement 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 and 25, where he says, But this I say by way of concession, not of commandment. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, but I give my judgment, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be trustworthy. There are those who think that Paul does not seem to have been sure here that he had the word of the Lord in this particular matter, but that is not the meaning of the passage. The meaning of verse 6 is that his teaching, which he had just given, was by way of concession to their weakness, and not a commandment as to what they must do. And the teaching of verse 25 is that the Lord, during his earthly life, had given no commandment on this subject, but that Paul was giving his judgment. But he says distinctly that he was giving it as one who had obtained mercy of the Lord to be trustworthy. And furthermore, in the 40th verse of the chapter, he distinctly says that in his judgment he had the Spirit of God. But even allowing that the other interpretation of the passage is the correct one, and that Paul was not absolutely sure in this case that he had the word of the Lord and the mind of the Lord, that would only show that where Paul was not absolutely sure that he was teaching in the Holy Ghost, he was careful to note the fact, and this would only give additional certainty to all other passages that he wrote. It is sometimes said that Paul taught in his earlier epistles that the Lord would return during his lifetime, and that in this matter he certainly was mistaken. But Paul never taught in his earlier epistles, or any other epistles, he never taught anywhere that the Lord would return during his lifetime. 
This assertion is contrary to fact. He does say in First Thessalonians, which was his first epistle, the fourth chapter and seventeenth verse, Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them, i.e. the believers who had already fallen asleep, be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. He does here put himself in the same class with those who were still alive when he wrote these words. He naturally, and necessarily, did not include himself with those who had already fallen asleep. In speaking of the Lord's return, he does not say, nor hint, that he will still be alive when the Lord returns. It is quite probable that Paul did believe at this time that he might be alive when the Lord returned, but he never taught that he would be alive. The attitude of expectancy is the true attitude in all ages for every believer. This was the attitude that Paul took until it was distinctly revealed to him that he would depart before the Lord came. I think it very probable that Paul, in the earlier part of his ministry, was inclined to believe that he would live until the coming of the Lord, but the Holy Ghost kept him from so teaching, and also kept him from all other errors in his teaching. The sixth thing that the Bible makes clear as to the inspiration of the apostles and the prophets is that the Holy Spirit in the prophets and apostles gave not only the thought, but also gave the words in which the thought was to be expressed. We find this very clearly stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. One of the most popular of the false theories of inspiration in our day is that the Holy Spirit was the author of the thought, but that the apostles were left to their own choice of words in the expression of the thought, and that therefore in studying the Bible we cannot emphasize the exact meaning of the words, but must try to find the thought of God that was back of the words, and which the writer has more or less inaccurately expressed. There are many teachers in our theological seminaries today, and in our pulpits, who speak very sneeringly and superciliously of those who believe in verbal inspiration, i.e. those who believe that the Holy Spirit chose the very words in which the thought he was teaching was to be expressed, but however sneeringly they may speak of those who believe in verbal inspiration, certainly the Bible claims that it was verbally inspired. The passage which I have just read makes it as plain as language can possibly make it that the words in which the apostles spoke were not words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Spirit teacheth. Now if this is not the fact, if only the thought that was given to Paul was the thought of God, and he clothed the thought in his own words, then Paul was a thoroughly deceived man on a fundamental point, in which case no dependence at all can be placed in his teachings on any point, or else he was a deliberate fraud, in which case the quicker we burn up his books the better for us and all concerned. There is no possibility of finding any middle ground, and the attempts to find a middle ground have landed those who have tried it in all kinds of absurdities. If you have an exact and logical mind, you must take your choice between verbal inspiration and bald infidelity. Paul distinctly states that the words in which he conveyed to others the truth that was revealed to him were the words which the Holy Spirit taught him. The Holy Spirit himself has anticipated all these modern ingenious, but wholly unbiblical, and utterly illogical, and entirely false theories regarding his own work in the Apostles. The theory that the concept was inspired, but the words in which the concept was expressed were not, was anticipated by the Holy Spirit himself, and exploded 1,800 years before our supposedly wise 19th century theological teachers conceived it, and attempted to foist it upon an unsuspecting public. It was exploded 18 centuries before it was exploited. Furthermore, the theory is absurd in itself. As the only way in which thought can be conveyed from one mind to another, from one man's mind to another man's mind, or from the mind of God to the mind of man, is by words. Therefore, if the words are imperfect, the thought expressed in those words is necessarily imperfect. The theory is an absurdity on its very face, and it is difficult to see how intelligent men could have ever deceived themselves into believing such a thoroughly illogical theory. If the words were not inspired, the Bible is not inspired. Let us not deceive ourselves. Let us face facts. Furthermore, the more carefully and minutely one studies the wording of the statements of this wonderful book, the Bible, the more he will become convinced of the marvelous accuracy of the very words used to express the thought. 
To a superficial thinker, the doctrine of verbal inspiration may appear questionable or even absurd, but any regenerate and spirit-taught man who ponders the words of the Scripture day by day, and year after year, will become thoroughly and immovably convinced that the wisdom of God is in the very words used, as well as in the thought which is expressed in the words. It is a significant and deeply impressive fact that our difficulties with the Bible rapidly disappear as we note the precise language used. The changing of a word or letter, or of a tense, case or number, would oftentimes land us in contradiction or untruth. But taking the words exactly as written, difficulties disappear, and truth shines forth. Countless times people have come to me with apparent difficulties and supposed contradictions in the Bible, and asked a solution, and I have pointed them to the exact words used, and the solution was found in taking the words exactly as written. It was because they changed in a slight degree the very words that God spoke that a difficulty had seemed to arise. The divine origin of nature shines forth more and more clearly the more closely we examine it under the microscope. As by the use of a powerful microscope we see the perfection of form and the adaptation of means to end in the minutest particles of matter, we are overwhelmingly convinced that God, a God of infinite wisdom and power, a wisdom extending down to the minutest parts of matter, is the author of the material universe. So likewise the divine origin of the Bible shines forth more and more clearly under the microscope. The more minutely we study the Bible, the more we note the perfection with which the turn of a word reveals the absolute thought of God. An important question, and a question that has puzzled many writers at this point, is, if the Holy Spirit is the author of the very words of Scripture, how do we account for the variations in style and diction? How is it, for example, that Paul always used Pauline language, and John used Johannian language, and Peter used language that was characteristic of himself. The answer to this question is very simple and is twofold. First, even though we could not account at all for this fact, it would have little weight against the explicit statement of God's word with any one who is humble enough and wise enough to recognize that there are a great many things which he cannot account for at all, which could be easily accounted for if he knew a little more. It is only the man who has such amazing and stupendous conceit that he thinks he knows as much as God, in other words, that he is infinite in wisdom, who will give up an explicit statement of God's word simply because he sees a difficulty in the way of the acceptance of that statement, which he in his limited knowledge cannot solve. But there is a second answer, and an all-sufficient one, and that is this. These variations in style and diction are easily accounted for. The Holy Spirit is infinitely wise. He himself is the creator of man and of man's power of speech, and therefore he is quite wise enough and has quite enough facility in the use of language in revealing truth to and through any individual to use words, phrases, and forms of expression that are in that person's ordinary vocabulary and forms of thought. And he is also quite wise enough to make use of that person's peculiar individuality in revealing the truth through him. It is one of the marks of the divine wisdom of this book that the same divine truth is expressed with absolute accuracy in such widely variant forms of expression. The seventh thing that the Bible makes plain regarding the work of the Holy Spirit in the various writers of Scripture is that all Scripture, that is, everything contained in all the books of the Old and New Testament, is inspired of God. We are distinctly taught this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Here we read, All scripture, more exactly, every scripture, is given by inspiration of God, more literally, God breathed, and is profitable for doctrine, or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, rather, instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, rather, complete, thoroughly furnished, better, furnished completely, unto all good works, rather, every good work. An attempt has been made to obscure the full force of these words by revised translation, given in both the English Revision and the American Standard Version. In this revised translation, the words are rendered as follows. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, 
that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. There is absolutely no warrant in the Greek text for changing every scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, etc., into every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, etc. Every is in the Greek. There is no is in the Greek. It must be supplied, as is often the case in translating from Greek into English. Is must be supplied somewhere, either before given by inspiration, or God breathed, or else supplied after it, in the latter case necessitating the change of and into also, a change which is possible but very uncommon. And there is not a single instance in the New Testament outside of this, in which two adjectives, coupled by the simplest copulative, and, are ripped apart, and the is is placed between them, and an and changed into also. The other construction, that of the authorized version, is not at all uncommon. The translation of the revisers does violence to all customary usage of the Greek language. But we do not need to dwell upon that, for, even accepting the changes given in the revision, the thought is not essentially changed. For if Paul had said what the revisers make him to say, that every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, etc., there can be no question but by every scripture inspired of God, he referred to every scripture contained in the Old Testament. Here, then, taking whichever translation you will, we have the plain teaching that every scripture of the Old Testament is God-breathed, or inspired of God. Certainly, if we can believe this about the Old Testament, there is no difficulty in believing it about the New, and there can be no question that Paul claimed for his own teaching an equal authority with the Old Testament teaching. This we shall see clearly under the next head. And not only did Paul so claim, but the Apostle Peter also classes the teaching of Paul with the Old Testament teaching as being Scripture. Peter says in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, wrote unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, wherein are some things hard to understand, which the ignorant and unsteadfast rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Here Peter clearly speaks of Paul's epistles as being scripture. The eighth thing that the Bible teaches concerning the extent of the inspiration of its writings is that, because of this inspiration of prophets and apostles, the writers of the Bible— the whole Bible as originally given, becomes the absolute inerrant word of God. In the Old Testament, David says of his own writings, in Second Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, a passage already referred to, The Spirit of Jehovah spake by me, and his word was upon my tongue. In Mark chapter 7, verse 13, our Lord Jesus himself calls the law of Moses the word of God. He says, Making void the word of God by your tradition, which you have delivered. In the verses immediately preceding, he has been drawing a contrast between the teachings of the Mosaic Law, not merely the teachings of the Ten Commandments, but the other parts of the Mosaic Law as well, and the traditions of the scribes and Pharisees, and has shown how the traditions of the scribes and Pharisees flatly contradict the requirements of the law as given through Moses, and in summing up the matter he says, in the verse just quoted, that the scribes and Pharisees made void the word of God by their traditions thus calling the law of Moses the word of God. When I was in England, a high dignitary and scholar in the Church of England, in a private correspondence, tried to call me down by saying that the Bible nowhere claimed to be the word of God, but I replied to him by showing him that not only did the Bible claim it, but that the Lord Jesus himself said in so many words that the law given through Moses was the word of God. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul claims that his own epistles and teachings are the word of God. He says, As for this cause, we also thank God without ceasing, that when ye received from us the word of the message, even the word of God, ye accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also worketh in you that believe. Here the Apostle Paul claims for his own teaching in the most absolute way that the message that he gave was the word of God. When we read the words that Jeremiah wrote, and Isaiah wrote, and Paul wrote, and John wrote, and James wrote, and Jude wrote, and the other Bible writers wrote, we are reading what God says. 
We are not listening to the voice of man, but we are listening to the voice of God. The word of God, which we have in the Old and New Testaments, as originally given, is absolutely inerrant, down to the smallest word and smallest letter, or part of a letter. Our Lord Jesus himself says at the Pentateuch in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass away from the law, till all things be accomplished. Now a jot is the Hebrew character yod, the smallest character in the Hebrew alphabet, less than half the size of any other letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and a tittle is part of a letter, the little horn put on some of the Hebrew consonants, less than the cross we put on a T. And here our Lord says that the law given through Moses was absolutely inerrant, down to the smallest letter or part of a letter. That certainly is verbal inspiration with a vengeance. Again, he said, as recorded in John chapter 10, verse 35, after having quoted from the 82nd Psalm and the 6th verse as conclusive proof of a point, the scripture cannot be broken, thus asserting the absolute irrefragability or inerrancy and finality of the scriptures. If the scriptures as originally given were not the inerrant word of God, then not only is the Bible a fraud, but Jesus Christ himself was utterly misled and is therefore utterly unreliable as a teacher. I have said that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, as originally given, were absolutely inerrant, and the question, of course, arises as to what extent is the authorized version, or the revised version, the inerrant word of God. The answer is simple. They are the inerrant word of God, just to that extent that they are an accurate rendering of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, as originally given, and to all practical intents and purposes, they are a thoroughly accurate rendering of the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as originally given. There are, it is true, many variations in the many manuscripts we possess, thousands of variations, but by a careful study of these variations, we are able to find with marvelous accuracy what the original manuscripts said. A very large share of the variations are of no value whatever as it is evident from a comparison of different manuscripts that they are mistakes of a transcriber. Many other variations simply concern the order of words used, and in translating into English, in which the order of words is often different from what it is in the Greek, the variation is not translatable. Many other variations are of small Greek particles, many of which are not translatable into English in any way. When all the variations of any significance have been reduced to the minimum to which it is possible to reduce them all, by careful study of manuscripts, there is not one single variation left that affects any doctrine held by the evangelical churches, and the scriptures as we have them today translated into our English language, either in the authorized version or revised version, are to all practical intents and purposes the inerrant word of God. End of chapter 1